Hello everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. Hope everybody is feeling blessed and had a good day in the Lord. If you just start your day off to watch this, consecrate it to the Lord. Give, get, give your day to the Lord and uh, see if he doesn't bless that. We're going to continue um, with the series I started. Let me just say before I do get started uh, next week, um, my wife and I and some of our kids, our three youngest, we're going to be going um, to uh, my wife's parents' house to be helping them. Um, uh, they are looking at eventually moving, so they're needing to go through stuff. And um, so we're going to try to go there and help. Um, so we will not actually be here next week, so we will not be having a uh, Wednesday night Bible study. But we will, so that will be the 10th. But then we'll come back on the 17th and have we back to our normal schedule. All right. Well, tonight, uh, as we're going on in our series, The Difficult Teachings of Christ, I want to talk to you tonight about the wide and the narrow path and the wide and narrow gate. Uh, Matthew 7, verses 13 through 14, Jesus teaches um, us to enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction and there are many who enter through it the gate is narrow and the way is constricted that leads to life and there are few who find it so sometimes we come across a teaching of Jesus and we simply don't understand it now this requires us to study uh, to dig into some of the original language the Greek language maybe the the mindset of the Hebrews who are doing the um, the thinking, you know, uh, the Hebrew mindset, the culture of the time, uh, that does help us sometimes. Um, also, a very big part of things we don't understand is to search other parts of the Bible uh, to help us understand the full picture of what Jesus is saying. It's always dangerous to take just one scripture and uh, build a whole doctrine out of it. You have to take the whole council of scripture. But other times, it's not that we don't understand. A teaching of Jesus it's that we simply don't want to accept it um, this requires more than just study although this helps if you're having difficulty accepting something although sometimes when we're having difficulty accepting something Jesus says when we study we do so with a bias um, looking for um, a way to explain away something we don't like um, so you have to be careful of that but it requires, when we come across a teaching, just we simply don't want to accept. Okay, The meaning is kind of clear, and I think the meaning for this is somewhat clear uh, for these scripture. Uh, it requires more than study. It requires submission. Instead of trying to make God, and, and that includes Jesus, Jesus is God, uh, into who we want him to be, we need to submit our hearts to who he is. See, the Bible isn't just looking for, um, you know, uh, we're trying to build up this Jesus and who we think he is and what we want him to be. This is like, in a way, it's God's autobiography, if you will, or it's his revealing of himself to us. And when we don't like something that he says or something about him, then that means we don't like God. Um, uh, now sometimes people will misinterpret something and we don't like that interpretation but in the end oftentimes reading God's word we have to submit say this is who God is and if I don't like something maybe there's certain aspects of theology that uh, boy if that's true then I don't want to believe it well I've come to my point in my life where there might be some aspect of theology that people might differ in the way I think. But then I come to the say, but if they're right, God is God and he is who he is. And I love him no matter what. Um, even if he doesn't fit into my thinking of who he should be. He is a real being. And we don't get to make him into our own image. Okay? It's not like, you know, Spider-Man has changed, you know, nine times. And Batman has changed into a different actor and different... Um, villains and now the villains are the good guys and the good guys are the bad guys that's not the way God is 
God is who he is. He's not a fictional character. He is real, and we don't get to change him. In fact, he changes us. Um, one of the reasons this scripture is difficult about entering through the narrow gate, few, who, few find it, is because we don't want to accept it. We have to humble ourselves, submit ourselves, and worship and serve and love God for who he is, not who we want him to be. You know, we may want Santa Claus or Mr. Rogers or Obi-Wan Kenobi, but that's idolatry. It's turning God into another strange deity that is not him. He is not none of those people. He is who he, he is the great I am. He is above and beyond all of that. Um, he's beyond who your father and mother were. You know, sometimes we we associate God with maybe one of our parents. God's ab above that. That he is not that. He is not your favorite pastor or the pastor that really hurt you or ticked you off. He's neither of those. He is God. So when we read the Bible, the first thing we need to do is submit and let God use his word to reveal to us who he is. That's where why we need to have an open heart when we come to the Bible, not with our notions, our preconceived ideas, but God, show me who you are. Reveal yourself to me. Um, I want to know you, the real you, not the one that uh, I think you should be or other people tell me you are, but what your word says you are. Now, let me say that about this scripture. It is sometimes misinterpreted as well. It is sometimes hard to understand, not just simply because um, we don't like it, but simply because there's some people that don't understand it. Um, some people will read about the narrow gate and the winding path and how few enter into this eternal life and our mind automatically goes to being good enough okay we think well that means if a few enter that means I have to be good enough that's what the few means um, and uh, we tend to think that it means following all of God's rules and commandments and that is how we will walk the winding path and enter the narrow gate that's what the Pharisees thought really too Jesus said later on in Matthew, chapter, same chapter 5, verse 20, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So it's not just by following the rules and doing all the commandments and being a good person. That's not what the narrow gate is talking about. In fact, Christ is using the commands of all the Sermon on the Mount all the various things, you know, don't hate, turn the other cheek, um, uh, you know, give, don't lust, uh, don't call your neighbor a name. Um, he's using all these things to show this audience that he's speaking to, the multitudes, um, consisted of both believers, unbelievers, um, probably Gentiles even that were there, Samaritans, Pharisees, tax collectors common people, rich people, Romans. Um, he was trying to tell them all and show them all, they you can't obtain righteousness required to enter the kingdom of heaven. He's saying the Pharisees don't have enough of it. That was his way of saying, I'm going to show you, I'm going to list all these things and see you can't do it. We could never be more righteous than the Pharisees, at least not on our own. Of course, they... The Pharisees, they did all the quote-unquote right things, and especially the rules they made up, uh, not necessarily the ones that God had laid down. Um, but they had terrible things in their heart. Jesus said they were like whitewashed tombs, okay? On the, on the outside, they were all painted nice. On the inside, they were dead. Um, and Jesus spoke a lot about what is the inside of a person is because of this. I spoke about it Sunday, being transformed in your mind, that Jesus is interested in who we are inside, not just what we do. And there's where we are often found deficient, or where we always are. We, we, we're unrighteousness in our mind, in our thoughts. And so we can't um, travel this narrow path and enter the narrow gate simply by following the rules or the commandments. Well, the narrow gate and the winding path, it does describe a difficult path. Uh, it does describe a path that's not only difficult to walk, but difficult to see. 
the path to eternal paradise, the path to God, the path to heaven. While it is right there to find, so many people cannot see it. Uh, you know, it's like one of those paths that people might pass all the time. Sometimes little roads and stuff, people pass all the time. It's right there, but people just pass by and they don't see it. They don't pay attention. Um, in, in this way, the narrow gate is a fairly straightforward concept. The narrow gate is harder to pass through than one that is wide, and only a few people can go through a narrow gate at once as well. well there's another way where it's a difficult path and difficult to find. But let me see. Let's interpret scripture with scripture. I said that earlier. In John 10, 8, Jesus said, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. So if Jesus is that narrow gate, he's right there. He's probably the most famous person in the world. All kinds of people know about him. But so many people refuse to see it. They pass by him. They don't give him the time of day. They, you know, they think about him like they do Christopher Columbus or Gandhi or... Um, you know, Babe Ruth, some other historical person. You know, he was a nice guy, but they don't take the time to seek out Jesus, to seek out what God is saying to us, that he is the path of salvation. Uh, the reason is not well-traveled, the reason that this path, this gate, is not well-traveled is because Satan creates all these other paths, right? He talks about uh, broad is the gate that leads to hell. Well, these are all paths created by Satan. They promise the moon, but deliver hell. They are full of bright lights, full of dazzling temptations, full of good feelings, but they're all based on lies. One time I drove through Vegas, and it reminds me of the, the broad path that leads to hell. You know, all kinds of bright lights and big city, right? And all the promises, and it's a city of broken dreams, of wasted fortunes, of venereal disease, um, of shattered hopes and drug addictions. Um, and once again, you know, hey, I'm not here to slam on Vegas. I'm just saying that reminded me of Satan's broad path. But it, it's the most well-traveled, you know. But then you go, you go outside of Vegas and Nevada, and there's all kinds of little paths that nobody knows about. Um, and uh, so that's the narrow path is one that is there anybody can find it but they're distracted by you know these other paths that Satan creates full of good feelings but they're all based on lies think of some of the other paths false religions um, humanism is another one well you know I just humanity is good enough and certainly you know um, uh, that uh, you know no God is gonna uh, condemn humans because we're you know basically good people uh, hedonism you know it's just based on pleasure um, just pursuing pleasure you know we're only here for a short while eat drink and be merry for tomorrow we're gonna die and legalism it's again that's what the Pharisees problem is you know trying working your hardest to, to be better than the next guy so that God will choose you and reject him that's ultimately what legalism is, trying to outperform others. Um, there's asceticism. That's where you punish yourself, you know. Um, walk up a, a stone step on your knees or lay on a bed of nails or walk through hot coals or, uh, you know, don't talk for six years or, um, you know, only eat beans for uh, or you know green beans for a year or whatever there's always if I could punish myself then somehow I'll get saved I'll be the path of my salvation they all fought focus on trying to make our way to heaven but Jesus said no one comes to the Father except through me so that's part of that's a big part of what he's talking about when he says the gate is narrow that leads to heaven and very few enter it and the path is winding, the path is constricting, it's difficult to travel. Jesus talks about eyes being blind and hearts being closed. Uh, the path is there, but sadly, at times, people refuse to see it. It's too narrow for them to accept. Jesus was describing the pathway to life, true, eternal life, as something requiring effort as well and focus to enter. He said only a relatively small number of people 
ever even set foot on that path. Now, yes, when you think about it, there's millions and millions of people that will be in heaven, but you think of the billions and billions that have lived, that's where the number becomes small uh, in comparison. But getting onto the path is only the first step. When he said difficult is the way which leads to life, Jesus was explaining how hard being a Christian really is. Difficult is from the Greek word plebo, which means to press as grapes press hard upon. A compressed way. Um, a narrow, straightened, contracted. Metaphorically, the word can also mean to trouble, to afflict, to distress. It's a path of distress sometimes. If Jesus wanted to draw people to follow him, why did he tell these possible disciples that by following him, they would find they would have grief and they would have um, some um, persecution and they would have some difficulty? Part of what Jesus is saying here is when you choose the walk of the path of salvation in Jesus, you're going to face resistance, you're going to face temptations to leave the path. Uh, people aren't going to understand why you're on the path. They're going to try to get you off the path. Um, this is why so many people don't do not enter into the narrow gate, because they start off, but they can't keep on the path. I like the seeds. Jesus talked about the sower and the seeds, and about how certain seeds were went on good soil, but other ones went on thorny soil or rocky soil or on the, on the hardened path. You know, and they all represent Satan or the cares of this life or the hardship of of the walk and they all serve to get people off the path to eternal life so that's part of what he was saying about it constricting is because there's a lot of people that might start off on it but they, many tend to peel off and they don't persevere they don't stay on the path once again this is not difficult to understand I don't think um, it may be a little bit but it's difficult to accept I think we would like God to make the path easy. Maybe have a nice limousine pick us up, or a monorail, like they have at Disney World, and just, you know, glide to heaven. Maybe a nice rickshaw, you know what those are, those little carts that they have over in China, or they used to have, they probably still do for the tourists and in the Far East, and people would send them and someone would carry them to the city. Uh, maybe we think, well, we'd be in a nice rickshaw, and Jesus is just going to you know, carry us around, and the path there is going to be super paved path, 17,000 lanes wide, no potholes, no stop signs, no traffic jams, climate controlled. Uh, you know, I'm speaking metaphorically here, right, of the path to heaven being super easy for us. But Jesus is letting us know that this path will have some difficulties. There'll be some winding in the path. There'll be some big stones that people put to trip us up. There'll be some dangers along the way. This path, this narrow gate, requires our commitment, requires, requires our priority. If we're going to stay on this path, we have to make it a priority. It requires our focus. We have to be focused on staying on the path. We do not get there by following the rules, but by following the Savior. He is walking with us. There's times, kind of like that old poem of the footprint in the sands, and the person looks back, and they see the path of their life and then there's two footsteps except for during the really difficult times and um, uh, then there's only one set of footsteps and the person asks Jesus Jesus you walked with me except for when it got difficult where were you then and he said well that's when I was carrying you so in the end when you're walking on this path with Jesus then there's times where he's carrying us through um, that we really can't make it uh, on this winding, narrow, dangerous path sometimes by ourselves. But we don't have to. That's the great thing about being a Christian. Is that in our weakness, He is made strong. Uh, in our frailties, He has shown how mighty and powerful He is. So the key is to never let go of Jesus. He is your guide. He is your sustainer. He is their comforter. He is your strength as you walk the path of eternal life. So um, I hope you uh, got something. We're blessed um, from this teaching. Um, it always is a blessing for me as I study it and a reminder to me. Uh, let me pray for you tonight. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the one that's watching this and for those that are, have been on the path 
Maybe you've been discouraged. I pray your encouragement and your strength for them. Lord, for those that are feeling discouraged right now and have felt like they're, they've gotten off the path, help them get back on. Bring them back, Lord Jesus. For someone maybe who's watching who's never started, who's thought about following you, Jesus, who's thought about uh, surrendering to you, submitting to you, and making you their Lord. Um, Lord Jesus, let them take that first step along this path uh, as they as this video ends. Uh, Lord Jesus, help them make that commitment to you. I ask you blessing now over everyone that is in the sound of this voice in your name. Amen. Well, God bless everyone. I hope you have a um, blessed evening, a blessed day, a blessed week. Um, we will be here Sunday. Um, and looking forward to sharing again more from Romans from you. Just a reminder, next Wednesday night, we will uh, not be having Bible study. We'll be back again on the 17th. God bless. Bye.